Welcome to Fintech Impact. This podcast is an exploration of the financial technology world, interviewing different fintech entrepreneurs about what they do, their story, and what their impact is on consumers, incumbents, and the industry as a whole. Here's your host, award-winning financial planner, university lecturer, and writer, Jason Pereira. Hello and welcome to Fintech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have Andrew Ostro, co-founder of PolicyMe, a direct-to-consumer online insurance broker for life insurance. And with that, here's Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Hi there. Yeah, thanks for coming in at the day. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate no, being here. My pleasure. So, Andrew Ostro, CEO of PolicyMe. Tell us about PolicyMe. Yes. Uh, so, PolicyMe, we are essentially a digital life insurance visor. So what that means is we provide a full stack of services to our customers. We allow them to come online. We run through a digital needs assessment, which recommends both whether they need insurance or not, and then how much they need and what type of policy would be best. And then we allow the customer to kind of play around with the recommendation, select what they want, and eventually process the application directly on our site. And we work with uh, several different insurers. So we show different quotes from various insurers. So we allow the customer to get the best price for what they need. Excellent. Okay, so we're going to dive into what the entire process and um, what the customer experience looks like. But before we get there, as usual, in this podcast, tell me about uh, your history. Like, where'd you come from? What made you target this segment? Why did you start the company? Yeah, so so I started my career as an actuary. I worked for a couple of years at Towers Watson doing pension consulting, mm -hmm. just two years there. Then I switched over to management consulting at Oliver Wyman, where I was for the last six and a half, seven years. And at, at Oliver Wyman, I worked in the insurance practice. So we were working with various insurance companies across Canada and the U.S., advising them on various strategic issues, whether it be digital transformations, risk, finance, operations, anything from, from uh, across the spectrum of what they'd be dealing with. So it was there where I first started to kind of get my perspectives on the life insurance industry from a professional standpoint. I was working with a lot of insurance companies who were all saying the right things. We need to innovate. We need to transform. <laughs> Uh, we need to get off our punch card system. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and customer first, right? That's and that's everyone's yeah. view. You go to any kind of insurance conference, any any presentation, and that's the first thing you hear them say is, "We got we got to be customer first. Yeah, that's a buzzword at this point. A lot of them, you know. Here's the thing. Absolutely, I agree with that. You have to be customer centric in your approach. I just think that all these companies have never thought that way. Right. So it's become a buzzword, right? Yeah. Like, what does that really mean? And you say that, and they're like, "Uh, well, we're going to focus on it. Well, right. focus on what? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah. And, and and you have these kind of cultural issues at the top level that almost prevents you from being customer first. Things yes. like we make more money off permanent policies. So why would we kind of implement a strategy that might push towards term? Yeah. Or we rely heavily on our independent distribution channels. Why would we do anything that could cannibalize that part of the business? So it was just various kind of principles like that, mm -hmm. that although they wanted to do certain things, we could see that they were somewhat restricted. Well, this is the innovator's dilemma, right? Like they, they're, they're married. You just nailed it. They're married to margins. And they're married to distribution channel, right? And they're terrified of disrupting either one of them. Exactly, exactly. So we, so I pretty much uh, determined me and my partner, Lauren McKay, who's another co-founder, and Jeff McKay as well, who's a co-founder at PolicyMe. We pretty much uh, decided that if this was ever going to work, if we were ever going to do something that's really customer first and really kind of serves our, our, our uh, consumers, then we'd have to do it on our own. And it wasn't going to be built from within an insurance industry. It's going to be built outside uh, an insurance company. So that's where we started and, and we went from there. The big issues we were, we were seeing with life insurance were a, there were a lot of people getting bad advice, a lot of people being sold policies that they didn't need or that were too expensive, too long in terms of the duration of the, the term or, or even permanent mm -hmm. was the first one. Two was that the customer experience wasn't great. I'm sure you know lots of uh, interactions. <laughs> what, what part of it? I'm sorry. I mean, you know, as a licensed insurance agent, first of all, your first point is absolutely true. Oftentimes a good agent can go in and see that the previous agent was there to maximize revenue and not maximize the protection to the client. I mean, I often scratch my head or not scratch my head, but I often get angry when I see people in their early to mid 20s sitting on a small whole life policy and a needs analysis that says multiple millions of dollars. It just, ugh, it just, it's annoying. And then as for the broken experience, again, what part of it? Because the entire process of applying for a policy at this point is just painful. Yes, yes. And and we kind of break it down into a few different segments. So the first is the onboarding, right? How do they find out they need insurance? How do they yeah. get that assessment? That piece is really what we focus primarily on. The second piece is then once you know what you want, once you've kind of aligned on a policy, how does that get processed and applied? That's one area where we've actually seen a lot of progress from the industry last few years. You see a lot of insurance companies building out 
uh, electronic applications and, and more straight through type processing, mm-hmm. cutting through some of the pain points in the underwriting in terms of booking your tele underwriting or various medical examinations. Yep. So we see a lot of improvements there already, certainly a way to go, but it was more the upfront piece that uh, where we saw a lot that hadn't been worked on. You have to go meet with an advisor in person. Uh, it's usually coffee first and another meeting, several hours of, of your time till yeah. you kind of align on what you need. And then going back to the first point, and what you are told you need might not even be the best thing for you. No. So those were the, the two biggest drivers uh, issues. The other one that, that we see as well is on the pricing. So when we look at the price for a term policy, it's about 60 cents on the dollar is what you're actually getting out in your claims versus what you're putting in for a premium. When you start adjusting for time value, money, interest, things like that. Mm-hmm. And that's completely fair and, and expected. You couldn't expect an insurance company to pay out a customer even money. They have operational costs, right? They have to pay their distribution, Absolutely. they have the regulatory fees, their whole operations. I mean, that, that, of course, you know, the, the assumption, of course, is that they live a the life expectancy, right? If right. they died the next day, the return is astronomical. Exactly. And, you know, and the, the argument is, well, term is there for that very temporary need, right? Right, right. But who, even, who, yeah, if, yeah. You, if you adjust for life expectancy and say, what do we expect to get out of the policy? No, from the insurance company, 60 cents. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And again, what we came back to there wasn't, we need to completely revolutionize the way insurance is priced and drive down costs. We think we'll be able to get some leverage and do some of that a little later on. But our biggest immediate fix to that is, okay, if insurance is expensive, then you shouldn't buy what you don't need, right? And it becomes extremely important to precisely calculate what someone needs and make sure they don't buy any more than that. So it's not a great deal on what they're getting, but it is necessary. It's an extremely important product for a young family with with kids and a mortgage to have protection in place. Absolutely. It's very important to make sure you're not overprotecting. And that's really what we founded all our algorithms, all our advice on. Excellent. So first of all, I agree with everything you said. And it's, it's funny because, you know, I, for years you hear these things about uh, surveys done that show that the average advisor who uses a needs analysis ends up not only closing more business, but also selling larger policies on average. Yet the percentage of advisors who actually use needs analysis is barely budged, right? It's just... You know, for whatever reason, people don't want to necessarily put that kind of work into it. But overall, that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. So let's talk about, uh, so you basically, you saw this need, you saw this problem. What was the initial conversation like with the insurance companies when you basically talked about this? You said there was resistance. I mean, I see you currently are on, on board with what, two, four, eight, nine carriers roughly? Uh, yeah, we, we, have, uh, we have seven that we're contracted with right now. Those conversations were, went well. I mean, the insurance companies want to support us. As far, I mean, we're essentially operating like a typical insurance broker right now. We we give the advice to our customers, we process the applications, and then we get a commission back from the insurance company. So they're happy to support us. They're happy for Nothing's us really to be breaking in their model, right? Exactly. You appear direct to consumer, yes. but you're not really direct to consumer. You're a broker. Exactly. We're not direct to consumer from the standpoint of insurance coming directly to the consumer, yeah. but we, yeah. We so they have no direct. channel conflict. Exactly. Yeah. So there, there's no issue from, from that perspective. So right now that's kind of how we're operating. And there are a few issues that we run into on our end in terms of how we process applications, because one of the, while it was definitely a good thing for us to get up and running quickly to be able to plug into the existing model, it did pose some issues in terms of these processes, these application processes are not designed for digital companies, they're designed for no. human advisors. So we had to be very creative about how we built our processes. We've worked with several insurance companies to allow us to do things slightly differently, not ways that create risk or, or legal issues, just ways that make more sense for digital companies. So we're still in the process of that. We've done a lot so far. Are they letting you tie into their application systems? Yeah, uh, so that's the, in terms of API, APIing in, we haven't done that yet. So Do they still, have APIs? <laughs> uh, there, a couple of them are working on them. Oh, okay, yeah. working on that. So, right. so I think we're we're also a good kind of test company for a lot of these, right? So yeah. these insurance companies realize, okay, APIs are the way of the future. And APIs is essentially just a plug-in to send data from one company to another or, or one platform to another. Um, and they realize that that's where the industry is heading. So a lot of them are, are happy to kind of test things out with us, try different things. And we knew that, w- that was always a struggle. If we were to go and say, okay, we're going to work with one insurance company, way easier in our end to set up a, a proper process from that perspective. But we think there's immense value to our customers and being able to work with multiple insurance companies and make sure that each person's getting the best price for their given risk class, right? You might have mm-hmm. a male 30 where many life is cheaper and then a, male, a female 30 where Canada life is cheaper, right? So by mm-hmm. having both on our platform, we can make sure both those people are getting the best price 
as opposed to just one. So how much is this being done on the front end right now versus say, you know, when you start filing an application, are you doing any intel intelligence behind specific risk cases? Like if this person smokes cigars once a month, uh, I should be using this company. Or if this person has a history of X, I should be using that company. Have you gotten to that stage yet? Or is uh, that so up? for smoking, yes. I mean, the basic risk yeah. classes, yes. Obviously that, that feeds into our quotes that we generate. In terms of uh, medical conditions, we have not. We haven't seen any good data or solid indications on this company will always give accept this risk where, for some, yeah. example, someone previously had a heart attack, they're better off with manual life versus candle life. Or yeah, you learn that through, through basically just trial and error, unfortunately. Right, right. Yeah. right. So, so we don't distinguish in terms of our recommendation as to which insurer to go to. Mm -hmm. For now, it starts off with just price. When we're dealing with term products, yes, there are certain feature differences or product differences. Our view is that no one should really be insured from protection perspective past the point where they no longer have an income. And typically it's actually before that. So we would say- Yeah, it's well before that. Assuming yeah. that they build a sufficient wealth. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, in, in my process, I actually break up insurance into three components, and this is a sidetrack, but the first conversation is always around a protection standpoint. So life, disability, critical loss, all of the, everything on the map, what's it going to take to make sure that your family's okay if anything happens to you? Second part is the tax planning aspects of it, if that's suitable, and then the last part's the estate planning. And the great thing about life insurance is it can meet all three needs. Yeah. The bad thing about life insurance is that all three needs are wrapped up and confuse the subject, exactly. right? So yeah, that's... Again, I agree with you in general. That's get them to the point where they no longer need the temporary coverage to basically get there. Yeah. And, and our algorithms look at not just how much insurance uh, the person we need if they were to pass away today, yeah. but also we project through time to figure out, okay, let's run everything five years from now. Let's say the person dies then. So what savings, savings rates. What are they and, accumulated, right? And yeah. their investments. What are, what, that's smart. What's the family's income? What's the family's expenses? And we do all those calculations and say, okay, five years from now. There's still insurance needs, so we need to make sure you're covered for at least five years. We continue to do that along a path, and that tells us whenever we see that insurance need go away or get very small, we say that's the point in time yeah. when we no longer need coverage. And if it's 20 years, then we get you a 20-year policy. Yeah, you see dropping off in year 18, you know what to recommend, and that yeah. makes sense. You guys looked at uh, stacking any of the policies, like doing a combination term 10 to term 20 to make sure that it drops off as, as it needs? We haven't looked at that yet. Yeah. So, th so that would be essentially saying if someone needs a million dollars today, but only 500000 10, 10 years. So yeah. $500,000 exactly. for 20 years and just another five hundred for the first 10. And we haven't looked at that at that yet. We think there's actually some product innovation that's needed here as well. Hmm. We would like more products where... The, the coverage is actually variable. Now, the big issue there, and, and insurance companies are probably, if anyone's listening to this from an insurance company perspective, would be like, there's a few. Why are, why, how could we ever change the, the coverage amount? All we're going to end up with is anti selection, which essentially means if someone gets sick, then they're going to opt for more coverage. If someone's not sick, they're going to opt for lower coverage. And now we're stuck giving more coverage to the people who are But theoretically, risks. you want to write a maximum cap, right, at the time of at the time of issuance, right? <laughs> like, you, you know, the, I would want to offer X at whatever amount and you, yeah, I mean, it's not easy. You can price in that risk to some degree and the, you advise, the client would have to pay a premium for that flexibility, right? Right, right. Yeah. So, and the, so that's, that's one way to do it and say, okay, we're going we're to take yeah. that risk from the insurance company and we're going to charge a cost to the customer to get that variability. Yeah. But we think there's probably more innovative ways to do that where we say, okay, the change in the coverage isn't dependent on a customer decision. It's dependent on an event. Mm -hmm. So we'd say, okay, this person might need more coverage if they were to have a child. Yeah. So we're going to say whenever there is a child, there's an automatic increase. And now you remove the customer behavior from the equation. You move the anti-selection from, anti from the equation. And now you don't need to charge the customer yeah. more. So it's examples like those where, where we feel that's where we're heading towards um, in the future. We think a lot of the opportunity here is in the product innovation and the pricing. We're starting with the advice. We think that's the biggest issue to tackle right now. Mm -hmm. And once we solve that and kind of build a more, little more scale and more leverage in the industry, then we'll move more towards the product side. And then I've seen that happen with MGAs where they get in the custom product to solve specific solutions. You're looking at it from a different standpoint. I must say, you know, your needs analysis is clearly better than the average simply because you're projecting over time, right? Mm -hmm. Some financial planning softwares will be able to show you that need change over time, but you're, you're simplifying that into a needs analysis process as yeah. well. So that's good. So take me through the process. Client finds you guys and basically, it says, you know, hey, this looks interesting. What does the experience start to finish? Yep. So it, it starts off, we have a lot of content on our, our site. So we have a, a big blog where we give all different perspectives on one, what our views are in different aspects, but also whatever we think the customer will need to make informed decisions, whether they go buy through us or, or through a different advisor. We want to kind of empower the customer with that, uh, with the perspectives and, and the, the content expertise. 
But if they choose, they can jump right into the advice. So they click Get Advice. We then go through, it's about eight screens or so, where we ask each screen is one question. We ask various questions relating to their family, their expenses, their finances, things like that. And or just the information that we feel we need to give a proper recommendation. And we struggle with this a little bit is we don't want to bombard the customer with too many questions. We also don't want to remove questions that would uh, decrease the accuracy or, or the value. It's a delicate balance. You got to build for speed without without uh, not getting the information you need. Right? right, right. And the last thing we want to do is give a bad recommendation. So we we tend to we've always sided more with giving the quality advice. Started with that, and then figure yeah. out where we can cut certain questions out that aren't really contributing to our advice. So that takes about uh, four to five minutes to go through that. And then they're prompted with a set of recommendations. It could be uh, typically two different recommendations, depending on the, on the case. We have various different types of recommendations, depending on what we know about the person. Um, those recommendations will not be in the form of different products or insurance language type uh, recommendations. It'll be more along the lines of objectives. So what do you want to do with your insurance? So one example might be, look, I want to make sure that my family has enough money if I were to pass away that they can continue their lifestyle as is. They don't need to, mm-hmm. my spouses need to change a job. Okay. We don't need to cut our expenses. So we'll look at all the savings. We'll look at the spouse's future income, look at everything in place, expenses, and we'll make sure the family can continue that and make it up with life insurance. But that might not be for everyone. If, if you're a younger family, maybe you don't have kids, maybe you're, you know your, your spouse would go back to work if you were to pass away. You might say that's too much protection. So my objective might be, I just want to support the transition. I want to give my family enough time to get back on their feet after if I were to pass away, mm-hmm. and then we calculate how much money that is, and that's uh, clearly a lot lower than what the full protection would be. Are you showing those scenarios side by side? Yeah, we show them side by side with yeah. coverage amounts, with prices, so the user has all the information they need to yeah. kind of compare and make the decision. But again, very focused on the customer need, the objective. Yeah. Here's the, the benefit product. first, and here's right. the the cost of said objective, and now basically decide for yourself. Right. And yeah. if you ask someone the question of those two objectives, which one makes more sense? It's way easier for the average person to answer than do you want a million or do you want five hundred thousand? Yeah, I know. Or you know, five times your income or whatever the exactly. other rule of thumb being used flavor of the day is. Yes. So okay, so you they say yes, we want to we want to purchase this insurance. What's the next step? So after that, so they get the recommendation. We walk them through again the different options. We walk them through the term length. We recommend the term length based on as we mentioned earlier the kind of projections through time. They align on what they want. Then they click next. We show them quotes from the from various insurance companies, all ordered by price, um, with a, uh, some tips on how they might uh, pick a different insurer. Our biggest suggestion is- what would that be? What, what are the key ones that you're trying to direct? So, so our biggest one is price. Uh, yeah. Again, we, as, as I mentioned earlier, that there are different product features, but because we're not concerned with renewals, we think no one should ever renew their term policy unless they become- the circumstances have changed or, yeah, I get that. I'm insured. Even Absolutely. if the circumstances have changed, you're always better off getting a new policy unless it's got well, to well, a point. That's, yeah, that's the old trick of the gotcha if your health has changed. Right. Yeah, I see what you're talking yeah. about. And, and conversions to permanent policies, we don't think those are in the best interest of, of customers as well. So we're not really concerned with the product features. From our mm-hmm. perspective, these term policies are pretty much the same. So what we say is, okay, price is, is the number one consideration here. Brand doesn't really matter because... At the end of the day, these companies are all kind of they hate protected. hearing that, but it's it's really it's, it's, true. it's the term is a plain vanilla product. Right. The one thing we do we are starting to push now as we're getting more data, selling more policies, starting to understand the experience a little better, is we are seeing companies that have better processes on the applications and underwriting side for various customers. So we're seeing that. There are companies that are way better at processing your applications quicker. Mm-hmm. There are companies that are way better with less emails, notifications, doing yeah. things together. So we're we're starting to implement that into our platform where we say, look, price is the number one consideration. If price is similar uh, and you're willing to pay an extra dollar, we'll show you where the better processes are and explain yeah. what they are. The speed to deployment, essentially, you want exactly. to get. Yeah. And that's, that's important. I mean, each of these companies has a different level, which they're willing to ensure without without full, assuming that you answer some questions correctly, that you basically do so basically in an expedited way with right. fewer questions or with less underwriting or no fluids or whatever it might exactly. be. Yeah. And the no fluids is a big one, right? So they're, Manulife, for example, if you're under a million dollars in coverage, they won't require blood and urine tests. And yep. that could be, some people might not care about that, but some people that might be very important and they don't want to deal with that. Yeah. So timing a lot of those that. things is a pain, right? So, right. So, so we're again, starting with price, but we are moving towards more of a process piece, but in terms of the actual product, we don't, we don't see differences there. Good. 
So overall, so the application, clearly you're dealing with looks like only companies that actually have online applications. Is that the case? Pretty no, much? actually, no, wait, 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 yeah, so actually okay, yeah. I kind of stopped halfway there on yeah, that process. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> as we, so we show the quotes, they can then select the quote they want and then they can start the application right there. So they'll go through the various questions. What we've done is essentially protected the customer from the pain points of the application. And we've been able to get those questions as a lot of pain in the application for, for, the, yeah. for the, the customer. So there's a lot of stuff that we can just answer for the customer. There's certain questions on the application that they wouldn't be able to answer and they would just be looking for us to answer, such mm -hmm. as, do you want any riders or any additional features added on? So we can make those decisions for the customer. We're not going to ask the customer. We're going to save them the time of having to go through that long application. Yeah. There are certain things we already know about them because we've already asked them their income for our needs assessment, we don't need to ask that again for the application. Marital status, any number of issues. Yeah. Exactly. And it's kind of the, the leftover questions that the insurance companies require to process the applications that we wouldn't know already, nor could we answer for them. Those are the ones we kind of ask on that page. Mm -hmm. So we are able to kind of create a much better experience for the customer to fill out their application. And then we can put, we use kind of technology in our end to, to, um, to build out the applications with those answers. The customer, uh, depending on the insurance company, so Manulife, for example, will submit the application. The customer gets an email from Manulife yep. with their full application. They then verify, sign off that everything is correct, and then we're, we're processed. Good. So I'm taking it, you know, wherever possible, you're looking for speed and, and, and good experience. So I'm taking you, are you, are you diving deep into these questionnaires? Are you basically in, in doing the full medical or are you leaving that to the telehealth? Uh, yeah, we're leaving that to the, the telehealth. Okay. We think that, um, it's actually, be, there's so many contingent questions built onto those questions. So, so this is really the medical aspects of the application we're asking about the family history we think it's a better customer experience that for that to be done on the phone mm -hmm. with the uh, with representative from the insurance yeah. company so Fair we enough. deferred that to, to post application good so then settlement basically policy comes into you guys you verify courier after them or i mean i know a couple of these companies are now experimenting with uh, electronic delivery of policies yep what's the general experience look like there yep so if there's uh, electronic delivery then the Policy gets emailed directly to the customer. Mm -hmm. They digitally sign off on it and, and we're done. We support that with emails from our end. So we don't just want you to get a confusing policy from a company and then have no idea how to read it. So we, as soon as we get a notification that's being sent out, make sure we, we send something to the customer as well with kind of a, a summary or instruction set, if you will, on how to understand the policy, what there is. The first thing you'll see on one of these policies is Here's your premium, seventy dollars a month. By the way, it goes up to twenty 5, years. It's five hundred a month. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. I just got a twenty-year yeah. policy. Why are you showing me extremely high prices? Twenty years from now, forty years from now, sixty years. Yeah, so we give all you the don't really care on, about that, really. Right? But, yeah. so, so we give all the context on what that is. Why you shouldn't worry about certain aspects. Why you might want to worry about certain other ones. And obviously, give them an opportunity to contact us if they need more help understanding the policy. But we've really broken it down into a very simple kind of set of information on how to understand their policy. In terms of servicing at this point, is that, you know, basically call number? Are you doing a lot? Are you doing that digitally? How are you handling that? Yep. So we haven't built out any of the functionality right now for, for more digital processing. So our platform right now, we're about a, a month and a half into to launch, um, is really mm -hmm. more on the onboarding application side. Our view is that we want to collect that data first. We want to, we're small enough right now that we can handle all our issues kind of in, on the phone or directly with the customer. We don't need to kind of create these efficient, automated, self-serving type tools. You don't need a bot doing all the work at this point. Exactly. Yeah. And frankly, customers, when those bots aren't done properly, they're, they're <laughs> it's usually a lot more painful than, yeah. than being able to speak to someone. So when we want to speak to our customers. Uh, yes, we're, we're very focused on digital and process, but we recognize that the process sometimes needs to be supported by a human advisor at times. You might have a customer get stuck or not understand something about the recognition or have more questions. We try and anticipate all those questions and embed it throughout our process. But we encourage our customers to contact us 24-7. It goes right to our phones, our, our cell phones. We have, we have a technology solution that links our, our lineup to our phones. And mm -hmm. we're available 24-7 to answer any questions or help our customers through any pain points they have. Excellent. So in general, what's the reception from clients early on been? So far, it's been great. We're getting a lot of customers who are kind of buying policies right away, going through the advice once, getting a recommendation, understanding everything, processing the application. We're getting some who are doing it once, uh, kind of coming back a couple of days later, completing it. So the reception has been great. The feedback's been really good. We're getting good uh, good feedback on the quality of our recommendations, the simplicity of it, the way they understand the process. Mm -hmm. So far, so good. I mean, there's, there's been certainly 
uh, areas uh, we've noted for improvement, areas where, where we've noticed the customer may be confused here or something we can do there. And we're continuing to iterating, collect feedback and perfect our process. You guys started collecting data on the speed of delivery. Because I mean, when these things, when someone's perfectly healthy, no history of anything, you know, you can take these things issued in days, right? Yes. It's great. The second a doctor gets involved, <laughs> yes. Have you found? Here's a better, the better question: Have you found a better way to make doctors reply to APS requests? Yes, <laughs> that's uh, that's one of the issues. We're actually dealing with a, a policy right now that's going through that process where it's now with, with the doctor. So to answer your question directly, no, we haven't we haven't solved that. <laughs> can you, can you program yet? something to just call him right. and remind him on a right. daily basis until he doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> it, it seems it seems strange that in today's day and age that that piece can't be automated and, and more uh, yeah. uh, more streamlined. But yeah, these are these are kind of issues we're noting as, as we learn more, as we collect more feedback, some more policies. And this is, as I was saying earlier, once we kind of get to a size where we can then influence insurance practice, insurance companies practices in, in the process, then we can start saying, okay, here are the four or five big issues that we've noted with our customers. How do we fix these? And how do we yeah. help you guys fix these? Because we're, we're building a pretty sophisticated infrastructure to be able to handle a lot of things in a very digital and automated way. And we'll be set up very well to kind of plug into these various uh, resources, whether it's plugging into like the o an OMA system where we can get more mm. automated physician reports, things like that. So as of now, it's more of just focus on the upfront, focus on the underwriting or focus on the application, on the advice. And we're going to get much better and learn a lot more about the, the pieces that are more with the insurance company today. Mm. And we're eventually going to want to take over some of those pieces onto our end and own more of the end-to-end -end process. So it's a very good little kind of termite strategy you have there. You get in there quickly and do the front-end side of it, and that gives you the data and the volume to hopefully start to innovate on the other side. Yeah, and the feedback, right? I mean, it, yeah. it, if you just wait too long to launch and you yeah. spend your whole two years building everything out and how you think it should work, you're going to be wrong, right? And no. waste all that time. We That's the great about thing about so this. You get an iterative process where you're exactly. constantly learning. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, just a little hint. They know that the doctors are a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm problem sure. from the reply standpoint. And you're yeah. right. I mean, I, I got to tell you, I look forward to the day where it's all digital records released under authorization because they are applying for a policy and it's done. I mean, right. it's... Uh, I'm in month three of an application right now, and it's just not pleasant. Yes. yes. I always tell them, like, if this goes well, you'll have it next week. If right. they need to talk to a doctor, you're going to be waiting. <laughs> so what were the biggest challenges you encountered in trying to start this, and what, how did you overcome them? Yeah, so I think our, our biggest challenge was, was trying to do too much too early. I know I've just spoken for the last 20 minutes or so about how we've gotten things out quickly, and we were testing yeah. learning. That was kind of a big hurdle culturally for us to get over at the beginning. I think we were on the mindset of, okay, we're going to build the perfect advice, the perfect process. We can't do anything until we've solved this whole experience and we were looking at this, okay, company A, this insurance company wants us to do it this way. Yeah. That's not going to be great for our customers. What do we do? Do we just stop? Do we like spend months and months and months negotiating with this insurance company to change that one piece? Or do we launch? We figure out a kind of a creative way to get around it for now and, and solve it later on. And I think getting past that mindset was, was very difficult at the beginning. Our whole kind of mission and, and principles was customer first. We want to make sure we're giving the best advice. We want to tell people who don't need insurance, they don't need insurance. We don't want to oversell. And that kind of seemed like if we complement that with the experience that isn't perfect, what are we doing? But I think getting over, so getting over that culture was very difficult. But once we did, I think it, it kind of uh, set us off running. And I think there was one one quote that I heard in a podcast very early on that helped. And it was uh, an entrepreneur that said, if you are proud of your first product, yeah. then you've launched far too late. Yeah. So I think it was, um, oh God, um, who started LinkedIn? Reed Hoffman yeah. said, yeah, if you're not absolutely ashamed of your first, la of your first launch, then you, you did too late. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. And it's, it's a hard lesson to learn early on because at the end of the day, you think you know best, but no, no battle no plan survives the first encounter with the enemy, right? Yeah. And not the enemy, in this case, the client. But, you know, you think you know best, but they're going to tell you that you don't, right? right? So, And there are so many features we wanted to get in pre-launch. And we essentially made a decision, look, this is the day we're targeting. Yeah. We're going to push these features to after launch. And once we started getting data and feedback, we realized we don't even need those features. There's, there's different ones that are more important or this isn't actually going to yeah. be valuable. So just getting out there quickly and getting that feedback was so valuable. That's the Steve Jobs quote about real artists deliver. Right? Yes. Like you can you can work on the art forever, but sooner or later that painting's got to be done and you got to monetize it. So um, next question is if you had if you could have one wish and about one thing you could change, what would that be? 
change within our company, within or, the your company or the industry yeah like not about world at large but let's talk about company industry what is, or whatever you would like to change the most yeah maybe. that's tricky i mean i think from from an industry standpoint like our biggest issue is is the kind of the application the medical underwriting i think if there's one thing we could change there it's just more streamlining on that piece right and i think very early on we realized that's not going to be for us to solve initially that's going to be for the insurance companies mm-hmm. but that's one area where we feel we don't have full control over the process and we'd love to see we'd love to get more control we'd love to have an insurance company say okay we recognize that this is kind of the wave of the future people want to do things faster more automated online let's sit down together over a couple of weeks and let's just build out kind of the yeah. ideal process and i think that the big struggle for us is that these companies sit there and say okay we can't make these changes because certain things are there for a reason and they're generally there to protect us from a risk standpoint from a legal standpoint and that's true for for a lot of things and that's typically how they start yeah but a lot of the processes get so out of control that you kind of lose sight of why you yeah. have something you have one rule and the bureaucracy blows to be an entire department around the one rule right yeah. like it, it happens yeah. and yeah it's it's you know and this is one of the great things about fintech is you know is, is the company's going to regulators and saying okay so why can't we do this well you can't do this because of x okay well you were trying to protect people from this. Can we just not do it a different way, right? right. And just getting them to rethink their entire process because that's not their job, right? Yeah. Regulators are there to, to create rules and stop stuff, yeah, right? Like, exactly, exactly. And well, in a good way to protect and people. The other one that's big on my mind, and I'm not sure if this is something to change, but certainly a wish. One of the things that we struggle the most with right now is just getting our brand across. Mm-hmm. We know we're giving the best quality advice that a customer can bet. We know our algorithms are so objective. Yep. We've actually told 25% of our users so far not to buy insurance. Some of these were, were people who were single, didn't have kids, yeah. no protection need at all. And they were coming on looking for insurance. And we said, stop, you don't yeah, need it. Like, I get that all the time too. It's like, you need to go look at disability or critical right. illness, go away, stop thinking life. I exactly. Life insurance because, yes, someone told you that because they're like, yes, it's affordable. You can get it now. But, right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So so what we'd, what we'd love is just what we're trying to still solve is how do we get that message across? How do we build that context before someone gets to our site or as they get to our site so that they know they're getting good advice here, great advice here. They know they're we're in their best interest. We're looking out for them. And that's been been difficult for us is building that branding and marketing. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting message to try to compel. I mean, how do you sincerely get that across? Right. I mean, yeah, the interesting thing, I think, is that anyone who takes the time to go through and gets a zero at the end of it, I think you may have won a customer for life there, right? right? Because, you know, they're like, these guys did not try to sell me something I didn't need, right? right? I'm sure that they'll go talk to another agent and the agent will basically make up some reason why they do need it. But, you know, they're like, well, this guy told me nothing and they've proved it with numbers. So I'd much rather be the monetary, sorry, the quantitative truth than the qualitative abstraction. Yeah, and we're seeing that so far. I mean, we've we've had uh, a few sales already where we recommended zero to someone Mm -hmm. and then they referred us to a friend a family member who then ended up buying a policy. Different so situation. we're getting that. That's kind of the best feedback for us. Anyone who's referring that, that's referrals like are see. a compliment. Yes, that's for sure. So last question before we wrap up, uh, what excites you the most about what you're working on, the industry in general, the company? Like, what is it that gets you out of bed every morning that makes you ready to go with this company? Yeah, it's it's very simple for me. I mean, as I said earlier, I think life insurance is an incredible product. I think when you look at what it does for society, what it does for families, who need it, it could be the difference between a family going into poverty or yeah. being able to continue to live their life after a death. So I think that's extremely exciting to me to, that there is such a positive, great product here combined with many issues in the industry. And when you combine those two factors, it creates so much opportunity for disruption and for change. Yeah. And I think that's what that's what really excites me. That's what motivates me. And I see so much opportunity here and very excited to see where, where this takes us. Absolutely. I'm excited to see where you go. I mean, and I agree with you. I think life insurance is one of the most dynamic products and one of the most useful ones in the world for protection. But in many ways, going back to its origins, was sold in a way that was not necessarily the best methodology, like door-to-door salespeople, little pocketbooks that would actually look up your rate and collect cash, right? right. Like the opportunity for abuse basically was exactly. there, right? So it's hard to, you know, it's, it's you know, a lot of people have a, have a negative opinion of insurance in general, but frankly, no one ever turns on the check when it shows up, right? right? And you're, you're, you're very grateful that you yeah. made that move. I think in all the net promoter score studies that I've seen, insurance ranks bottom of, or near the bottom, if not the bottom of the list with, out of any industry in terms of how customers are perceiving this yep. industry in terms of trust. So again, great product, a lot of issues, yeah. just creates a lot of opportunity. It's interesting. I've often, I've often thought that the life and health industry needs to break off and can call themselves something else because, you know, we get we get piled in with the property casualty side, exactly. right? And property casualty side, everybody's got an experience with why their car insurance company wouldn't do X, Y, and Z, right? Mm-hmm. And those are the, you know, those are the small incremental things, right? But 
you know, I've never had an issue paying out a, a premium, uh, sorry, paying out a benefit on life insurance policy right. or, I mean, you're dead, you're dead. Like, yeah, we're, we're not do, right? disputing that. Yeah, we're not disputing that, right? You know, even disability, like, you know, once you prove the case, it's done, right? Yeah. Like, at least in my experience, I'm sure that there's headaches, but it's one of those things where we unfortunately, you know, that was decoupled and people could think of it as two separate things. I think we'd be better off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, for, for sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Andrew, thank you very much for your time. This has been great. And uh, I'm sure many people will stop and check out your website, so. Great. Good thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. So that was my interview with Andrew Ostrom. Hope you enjoyed that. And as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is you get your podcasts. Until next time, I'm Jason Pereira. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.